for them. Hey, it's good to be here. Neil Jeffries, my name, and it's my a privilege to preach today. And uh, I, I preached last week. In fact, I think in my I, I, I've been on staff here for 34 years. I think that's the first time I've ever spoken two weeks in a row at, at <laughs> Prestonwood Baptist Church. And uh, it may <clears throat> it may. It may be a sign of the end times. I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure what it's the sign of, what it says. But anyway, I'm good to be here. Everyone is out uh, vac- vacationing. A bunch of our staff have been gone this in and out of this month. And so uh, I'm glad Jack and Jarrett and all those guys are doing what they do. Uh, I know they're doing something significant someplace, wherever it is. And uh, I, I do always, and I, I mentioned this last week, but I, but I do... I am a stutterer, I do stutter, and just wanted you to know if there's, there's a guest here that doesn't know, I want you to know I am a stutterer. Sometimes it, it's, um, it, it's not too bad, sometimes it's more exciting, and sometimes it's ugly, but uh, you never know. But anyway, that's, that's, that's the fact. And, you know, I was thinking uh, also, uh, you know, just being up here, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for Jack, obviously, who do, our senior pastor, who does this all the time. I mean, he's, he's been preaching for 50 years is pretty significant. And, uh, and of course, Jarrett, who does this all the time as well, it's a big deal. But I just, uh, uh, this is between me and you. I, I mean, it's, it's scary up here. I mean, it is. It's a big old place and there's a bunch of people. In, you can put a lot of hay in this thing. You know what I'm talking? And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a little, a little uh, frightening, especially for, uh, for me. It's, uh, I kind of, there's a fear, there's a trembling, there's a kind of kind of all of that, and so I'm, I just want you to know I've been nervous about this, and excited, but also nervous, but it's, it's a big deal, and I'm honored to be able to, to, to be up here, and Philippians 3 is where we're going to be today, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 is where we're going to be, and we're going to look at uh, a great statement that the Apostle Paul makes, and of course, uh, most uh, people uh, <clears throat> would uh, I guess agree that the Apostle Paul was one of the greatest Christians who ever lived. I mean, he just uh, was, uh, all that he did, he, he writes two-third of, uh, uh, two-third of the uh, New Testament. He uh, had three huge missionary journeys all around the world, started churches everywhere, and led who knows how many people to Christ, discipled who knows how many, just, just uh, to made an impact, Im- to literally impacted the world. Then and and, and uh, through his writings, through uh, all the books he he, he wrote, uh, including this one, I mean it's it's um, uh, uh, millions of Christians, and and he's going to share with us in verse ten. Uh, actually, this whole chapter, but actually this whole book, uh, he's going to share the secret of his life. Uh, the secret of his amazing life of ministry, the secret of his powerful witness for Christ, the secret of his, um, how God used him to impact the world, to make a difference, to be a light, to be salt, uh, just to be incredible. It's, it's, uh, and of course, it all boils down to his, his personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and uh, so let me just read what he says in verse 10. Now, ultimately, we're going to look at uh, verses 5 through 9 as well, and maybe uh, verse 11, but the main deal is verse 10. And there are four thoughts he makes here. He discovered the power of his, uh, or the secret of his his, uh, relationship with Jesus Christ and who he was. Here's what he says in verse 10. Uh, This is the prayer of his heart. Actually, This is probably a goal of his life. Now, uh, Philippians 3.10, I'm going to read it in just a minute. Uh, uh, I really am. But but, uh, back when I had just gotten out of seminary, I was with a bunch of ministers and, I mean, all these these guys who were really biggies and everything, and uh, we were talking and sharing. It was a kind of a formal thing. God was leading us. And he asked us, hey, I want everybody to share your life verse. I'm thinking, uh, I didn't even know you're supposed to have a life verse. I mean, <laughs> and I'm thinking, man, what do I do? And of course, all these guys are sharing these great verses and, and all this the commentary. And I'm thinking, oh, man, I don't even have a life verse. I got to think of a verse. What am I thinking? Am I thinking? 
of course, you, uh, you always have to act as if you've had one all your life, obviously. And the, but I'm thinking, I'm thinking, man, uh, uh, why first, and, and for some reason, I mean, God, I guess, had mercy on me and my ignorance, the most, but he, I thought of this verse, Philippians 3.10. So I shared that night. I kind of got out of there with the skin of my teeth. I mean, uh, that, that thing, I shared this is my verse, which, you know, that's, I've kind of lived my whole life that way, just kind of getting by somehow, I don't know, I, I, getting situated, I don't know how I got in this situation, God kind of showed me, you know. But anyway, I, I, I shared this verse. But it's amazing, this verse has become, over all these years, has become pretty precious. And the reason is because it's written by the Apostle Paul. And it's the secret of his life, of this who he was and, and how he lived. And what's amazing about the Apostle Paul is, is that, that he was obviously the greatest Christian probably who ever lived. But, of course, uh, outside of Jesus, but he was also a great sinner. In fact, he described himself as a great sinner. He said himself, I am the least of all the apostles, he described himself. He also described himself as being the chief of sinners. He says he was the worst of the worst because he always saw himself as, be, as being a great sinner because he knew he had persecuted Jesus. He was anti-Jesus for a long period of time. He wanted to persecute Christians in the church and destroy the whole thing. And so he always saw himself as being a great sinner. But you know what also is true? Praise God, the grace of, of our God through Jesus Christ is. It doesn't matter how good a sinner you are, God will forgive. God is saved. He'll cleanse. He'll make new again. And what, and what Paul came, Paul in Acts chapter 9, he's going to trust Jesus Christ as his Savior. And though he knew a lot about Jesus, of course, he didn't believe he was who Jesus said he believed and, and didn't believe he rose from there, didn't believe any of that stuff. He was attacking all that stuff. But in Acts uh, chapter 9, he actually sees Jesus Christ and he, he confesses his sin and he confesses his faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and his whole the miracle of salvation happened to him. And after that, even though he was anti-everything Jesus, now God's going to do a work in his heart and life. One, he's going to save him. Two, he's going to make him like Jesus in the image of Christ. But three, he's going to do something incredible in his life. He's going to do a supernatural, miraculous thing. Actually, in some way, he's going to change the world through this guy's life. Now, here's my point in what blows me away. Hey, that whole process I just described... That's not just for the Apostle Paul. That's for every human being on the planet. God wants you to know him as Savior and experience his life in you, his forgiveness of your sin, his cleansing of all the stuff in your life, of his making you a whole new person in Christ. Actually, salvation is the greatest miracle ever. But then he wants to do, just like he did in Apostle Paul, he wants to change him and make him a whole new person and then do something supernatural in him that makes a difference. Well, that's true of me, that's true of you, that's true of all of us. That's why this verse is such a big deal for me and I hope it might have a message for you this morning. Now here's what he said, I'm finally there. So let's read Philippians 3.10. None of that was in my notes. I, I just kinda, kinda uh, threw that in. Uh, that's not going to be on the test. You don't have to worry about, about that, that information at all. But this will be on the test. Philippians 3.10, he says, that I may know him. Let's point in the morning in just a moment. He wants to know Christ. And his, uh, secondly, and I also want to know, he says, the power of his resurrection in my life. That's the second thing. And he wants to know, he says, I may share his sufferings. Now, that's not as much fun as all the other stuff, the whole suffering part. And I, and honest, I don't, I don't understand all that, but that's a part of this, this whole thing, what Paul says, a secret of his life, what he experienced. And we're going to say some things about that in just a minute, but he wants to know Jesus. He wants to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings is what the old King James says. That's the third part. And then the fourth is this. Becoming like him, like Jesus in his death, which is the goal of the whole thing. That's the pursuit. That's what we're striving after is to have everything God wants to do 
in our lives, just like everything he did in Jesus' life, he accomplished it on the earth. He wants to accomplish it in our life as well. Fourth thing, here's number one. Paul prays, he says, I want to know him. I want to know Jesus. The whole Christian experience begins when we know Jesus personally. And here's the beauty, people. Hey, men, look at me right now. Ladies, listen to this. Here's the truth. You can know God. You can know Him. I'm talking personally. Not just somebody else, not just Billy Graham, not just Jack Graham, it's not Jared Stevens, not all these bitches. Hey, you personally, you can know God. And you can know Him. What was my second thing? You can know Him personally, uh, intimately. I mean, you can know not just things about Him, you can know Him, really know Him in an intimate, personal, and you can know Him powerfully, supernatural, that God does something in your life that literally is so awesome, so good, so uh, fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, all of it, so amazing that they can only be explained by the fact that God is doing something in your life with your life, through your life. He says, I want to know him. And the fact is, you can't know him. Now, obviously, that begins when you say yes to Jesus. Paul actually said yes to Jesus. When he, uh, when he, when he writes Philippians 3.10, it's been 30 years since he was converted in Acts chapter 9. It's been 30 years. Now, it all began when he first said yes to Jesus. And when he said yes to Jesus, this, uh, this great man, this Paul, who knew a whole lot about Jesus, because obviously he lived during the whole t uh, time of Jesus' life, his miracles, his teachings, his, his, uh, um, his stuff he did, his crucifixion, his death, what the people said was his resurrection, although he didn't believe any of that. He knew a, a whole lot about Jesus, and he was against Jesus. He didn't understand who he was. He, he thought he was a phony. He thought all these things. But in Acts 9, he had a moment when he came and he realized Jesus this is who he said he is. He's the Son of God. He died for me on the cross. You know what? I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. And I need uh, something in my life to make me the man God created me to be. So he trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Now he knows him. And of course, it changed everything in his life. I was a 16-year-old son. I'm in high school when I did that changed my whole life. You know what? You, I'm assuming most of us in this room, we've had that moment where you now know Jesus Christ because you know that you know that you know that you know you've accepted him as, as your Savior. But the point is, uh, if you are not sure of that, or if you've never done that, or you know in your heart, you don't know God the way you know God is through his son, the Lord Jesus. But just saying yes to him. Just saying, simple, Lord, I'm a sinner, I need a Savior, and He asked Him in your heart. He comes in your heart, and you know how awesome it is to know Him. And you know what else? On the other side of this thing, you also know that He knows you. He knows who you are. He knows where you live. He knows what's going on in your life. Actually, the Bible says He's known you before you were even born. In your mother's womb, He, knew. he knows everything. He knows everything about you. Uh, we can come to Him, obviously, and pray. And share stuff that's happening in our life, but he already knows that. He knows everything. He knows you. But how awesome it is to know him, to whom, to know, I'm not sure that's how you say it, but to whom, if it's who or whom or whatever it is, but to, and how awesome it is to know to whom it is to know is life itself, is eternal life. You can't know him. But that's true in salvation. But now, and this is interesting because Paul is writing this 30 years later. And the prayer of his heart, after having known Jesus for 30 years, the desire of his heart, the goal of his life, he says, you know what? I want to know him. I'm talking even more. There's something, there's, there's more here. And you know, he defines that a little bit. And this is fascinating for me. I want you to see, look at verse 5 of chapter 3. Because he's going to make some statements in, in uh, the 5 through like verse 8 that are pretty amazing. Because he's going to make some statements about uh, this degree in knowing Jesus. Obviously, he's known him for 30 years, but now he's experienced Jesus and knows him in, 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 in a whole new different way. He's going to say, he's going to, uh, um, he's going to actually list in um, 
uh, 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 3 verse 5, some uh, seven things he's always counted as gains in his life, good things in his life, things he, he's boasted in, the things he's proud of, t- t- things who he sees as the biggest things in his life, the reason he feels good about himself and who he is and what he does. He's going to list seven things, and here they are. Here are the seven things he says. He says, <clears throat> verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day. All that just, uh, is this, it just shows he's a true Jew. And of course, for him back then, that was a huge deal. He was a true Jew. Circumcised on, on the, uh, the second thing he says is, of the people of Israel. He's a descendant from one of the patriarchs, uh, Israel, who uh, was one of the biggies. He's, he, uh, he's in that line, he says. And a tribe of Benjamin. He was born in the tribe of Benjamin, which there are 12 t- t- tribes of Israel. Two of the favorite uh, tribes were Benjamin and Judah. He's he's in one of those uh, special tribes. uh, That's something to boast about. And he says, tribe of Benjamin, uh, 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 a fourth, Hebrew of Hebrews. Now, he's a Hebrew. That's a big deal. He's a Jew. But he isn't just a Hebrew. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews. uh, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I'm assuming it means he's a biggie. He's seen as a big. Everybody knows he's a big. He's a Hebrew. Of Hebrew. He's a big shot. He sees himself as a big shot. He knows he's a big. That's a big deal for him as well. And, and then he says, fifth, uh, uh, as, as uh, to the law, a Pharisee, you can't get any stricter of the law than a Pharisee. Everybody in, in the Jewish nation respected Pharisees because they were obviously big, but just knew the law, observed the law, taught all that stuff. Uh, he's one of those. He's a Pharisee. And he says, seven, a, um, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. He's against this whole Jesus guy and all this stuff back then. And then, and then seven, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Meaning, meaning he observed the law. All those things are things he always thought were gains in his life. Good things. Things he's proud of. Things that, that are his accomplishment in his life. And he always counted those as great accomplishments until he met Jesus Christ and he was converted. And when he was converted, he's going to actually see all these things he saw were such a big deal in his life as losses. Here's how he says that. Look at verse uh, 7. But whatever gain I had, all those things in his life, I, I count as loss for the sake of Christ, he says. Indeed, verse 8, I count everything as loss because of, and here's his point, because of the surpassing worth of of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For, for his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things. He saw all these things as loss and count them as rubbish uh, in order that I may gain Christ. He actually says all these things I once saw, saw as a big deal. Now I realize those things are not the biggest thing in my life, the biggest thing now in my life, and all the things I thought was, was a big deal, now I see even it as rubbish, because the biggest thing in my life now, what he's experienced all these years, he knows, it, 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 and the phrase he uses is, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. There's something there, something he experienced that was so powerful, so overwhelming, so full of peace, so full of presence, so full of purpose, so full of everything that he found in that he realizes nothing else in this world compares to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Now there's something there that he had 30 years ago, but now it's gone to another level because he's experienced it and he realizes what I found and what I have in Christ Jesus is better than anything this world has to offer. I want to know that. I want to experience that personally and powerfully in my own life. I, I want that, just to know him and to experience it. And it's interesting how he says that little phrase, Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, I've always thought this is interesting, and this is at least is interesting to me, but he says, he didn't say knowing Jesus. He says, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The Apostle Paul, when he refers to Jesus in all of his writing, it's interesting, he doesn't refer to him as Jesus. Now, the disciples did. The disciples when they were writing about Jesus and the, the books they were writing, they always said Jesus because they knew Jesus as, as a man here on the earth. And his human name was Jesus. So they referred to it, but Paul doesn't use that because Paul never saw him in his human flesh here on the earth. Paul only saw him as the risen Christ. So when Paul refers to Jesus, and I love he, he always refers to him as Christ, 
Jesus, my Lord. And this whole Christ thing, you can know him, this Christ, that's the Messiah. That's the name of the Messiah. That's the, 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 uh, the uh, messenger, the prophet of God. And Jesus, that's the Savior. That's our great high priest is who, who that is. He's the, the uh, uh, Messiah, prophet of God. He is God. He's the great high priest. And Lord means he's the sovereign king over everything and all things, the king of kings and Lord of lords, the one who's reigning on the throne today, always has been, always will be. And he actually says, all of that, you can know him. Now, that's a lot. There's a lot there, you know, uh, when I was a great, uh, when I was a kid, I, uh, this is flashing in my mind, but when I was a kid, you know, a, a Star Trek, I never really watched Star Trek as a kid, but you know, they, used all, they used to always say, the last great frontier is out there in space. Ultimately, you know what the last great frontier is? Is God. And however much you know him, there's a whole bunch more to know and to experience who he is in life. He's powerful, and you can know him personally, intimately, and powerfully. And the goal of Paul's life, he says, I want to know him. I want to pursue him. I want to experience him in his fullness and everything that, what that means is we got to spend, it's like any relationship, you got to spend time with, got to talk to, listen to, be involved in his word. Talk to him in prayer. Let him talk to us. And the point is, as we do all of that, as we spend time with him, as we grow in that relationship, our love for him will grow. We will become more and more like him, which is the object of, of, of what he wants to do. And we'll begin to think as he thinks. We will begin to act as he acted, to say what he said and to do what he did, and the more and more that happens one day, the dawn's going to break, the shadows are going to flee away, and you know what? When he comes back, we're going to see him face to face, and we're going to know even as we are known, which is fully, totally, and completely. The fact is, we can know the one who created it. We can know this one who created everything, who sustains it all now, who controls it, the one who knows all that there is to know, the one who is everywhere and is not anywhere at any moment, he's everywhere. He can do whatever needs to be done. He's all powerful. We can know him. He's the one who's actually lived here on earth. He's been through all the stuff I've been through, you've been through. He has been there. He's experienced life to the fullness, <clears throat> all of his joys, all of his sorrows, all of his pain, all of his, he's experienced all that stuff. And he fully understands, he knows, he loves, he cares, he encourages, he wants to forgive, do a whole new thing. He's good, he's patient, he's kind, he's helpful. And to know him is life eternal, John 17, 3 says, and to know him is the fullness of life now. And the fact is you can know him personally. Paul says, I want to know that, I want to experience, I want to have that in my life. Now, I got to be honest, I've, I've uh, as a young Christian through college and seminary, I kind of, I actually had some, some guys who wanted to disciple me and help me to grow, and I kind of, I don't know why I resisted them, I kind of wasn't, and I just, just, I mean, I was a Christian, but I just wasn't, wasn't something, I just wasn't. But I discovered it's not all that hard to make people think that you knew Jesus. And, and I actually started just getting to this deal of just, I was more concerned with making everybody think I knew Jesus. And really, it isn't all that hard. All you have to do is kind of say some things in conversation, just kind of mention some things every now and then. Like you just mentioned, just say in conversation, man, I had a great quiet time this morning. Man, it was awesome. Man, God showed up, it was incredible. Of course, you may not have even had a quiet time, but it doesn't matter. If you just say that, everyone kind of thinks, whoa, that guy, yeah, that guy, who is this guy? Or you can just say something like, um, but I'm, um, I'm memorizing the book of Deuteronomy <laughs> in Hebrew. It's awesome. And everybody goes, wow, that's a, you know what? I realize, 
But looking back over a lot of years, Baylor, sad to say, a lot of seminary. I was trying, if I had spent half as much time actually pursuing Jesus as I spent trying to make everybody think I actually knew Jesus, you know what I've gotten as a result? I would have gotten to know Jesus. I mean, personally powerful. I mean, really, you know what sad is? You know what's, what's tragic now? I'm a man, so I'm going to say this to, uh, to men. But, but I think it's, you know what's sad? I mean, too many men, one, have no idea who Jesus Christ is. He's not worth your life, you think, because you've never been in your knee to him. He's not worth your life. Too many of them, because they think, uh, uh, you got it figured out. You can handle what's ever happened in your life. And too many men only use the name Jesus, sad to say, as a curse word because they've never, you don't know Christ. Well, you know, that's the Apostle Paul. But you know what? Something needs to happen today. There needs to be a man here today who says, you know what? I know who Jesus is. I'm praying that it isn't just me talking to you men. If the Spirit of God talks to you and slaps you right upside the head and says, you know what? Hey, gentlemen, you need Jesus in your life. Oh, but you know what's also sad? Too many men. And again, I'm only speaking, picking on men because I'm a man. Too many men do something at church. I mean, obviously, you're here. You, you make a decision. You come forward and, and, and do something. And I guess you get saved. You make a decision. Something. But you know what? Too many men never, ever experience the fullness of what God wants you to have in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's usually because the man just doesn't pursue Jesus. Man, there's something there he wants you to have. He wants you to know. He wants you to experience in life. And how you experience that is you know him. What well, simply means I'm pursuing him. And two, there's a fight for this. There's a fight. Uh, to, uh, there's a fight to have a quiet time. Our schedule works against it. Everyone's busy. It's, there's a fight to pray. Obviously, we don't pray as much as we pray because it's just, it's just easier not to. It, everything gets in the way. There's a fight to say, you know what? I'm going to pray. I'm going to be. I'm going to do. There's, I'm going to do this, whatever it takes, because I want to know who He is and what I have in Him. But the result of that fight is the reward of knowing Jesus, like Paul did. But there's a second thing he says, real quick, and I got to hurry. He says, I want to know Him, but also I want to know the power of His resurrection. Now, obviously, there is something there. Now, obviously, this power of His resurrection. Obviously, we know Jesus died. He was crucified. He was buried. He was actually in the tomb. It was over. It was done. The enemy had, had won, it seemed. Death had defeated. Grave held him. But we know after on the third day, you know what happened. Jesus Christ rose again, conquering death, conquering the grave. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, death has been swallowed up in victory. That's the power he's talking about here. Now there's obviously two great uh, uh, powers that uh, Paul knew happened in his life and these work in our life. One is just the power to save. When you get saved, there's a power there that saves us because obviously we are dead in our trespasses and sin. We're not alive spiritually, but the miracle of salvation is we get saved and we are born out of death in the life, he says. It's a miracle. It's a powerful thing he does. But also, there's the power, this power of the resurrection say, saves us, but also it's this same power that sanctifies us and uses us to make a difference in this world. It, 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 uh, that which sustains us is the same grace, the same power that saves us. You know, we're saved. This whole, uh, we are saved from the wrath of God by the blood of Jesus Christ, what he did at Calvary. That's, that's Romans 5, 9. Listen to this. We're saved from the wrath of God and the punishment for our sin because of what Jesus did at the cross, his blood. Romans 5, 9 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. But we're saved from the power of sin by his life. By his, his risen life, his resurrected life. That's why Romans 5.10 says this. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we were reconciled, said we'll be saved by his life. That's why Romans uh, 6, 4 and 5 
uh, this is the phrase Mike Buster used when we baptized there. He, uh, uh, this is out of Romans 6, 4, and 5. He said, we were buried together with him by a baptism and the death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in death like his, we are certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. The point is, this whole resurrection thing, ultimately what this means is, hey, there is victory in Jesus. Jesus conquers all those things we think can and will conquer us that for three days conquered Jesus, but, but, but Jesus conquered all that stuff. And there is victory. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do what my wife asked me not to do. <laughs> because the symbol for victory is this. I mean, she said, don't, don't do that victory thing because, and the reason because it, it shows my belly. <laughs> See that? She, that's why she said. Uh, uh, I said, don't do that. <laughs> belly or no belly. There's victory. That's the point. There is victory in this whole thing. There's a power. Paul said, I know him. And I want the victory of the resurrection real in my life. That's the point. You know what's amazing about Paul? We think that Paul is this spiritual giant, and always he was. He was a John Wayne type. I've always seen him as kind of a John Wayne type. Always in control. Never, I mean, just kind of walking in and say, hey, a, a pilgrim. Everybody on the ground. I mean, it, uh, but I want to read this to you about uh, Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Listen to this. He says this. When I came to you, Paul says, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Man, I like that. He also says, he said, I wasn't a good speaker. And he says, but I wasn't even all that smart, I guess. For I decided to know nothing to know, nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse 3, for I was with you, he says, listen to this, in weakness, in fear, much a trembling, and my speech and my message was not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith may not rest on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul said, and I love this, and I'm, I'm not placing myself in the same place as Apostle Paul, but here's what I want you to see. The way I started this thing... This is scary. I've got some fear and trembling. I feel weakness. That's Apostle Paul. He experienced that stuff. He had that stuff in his life. He didn't have it all figured out, but he knew the one who has the answer is Jesus Christ. That's why he's pursuing Jesus, because he knows what's amazing is, and, 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 uh, and also he had a thorn in his life, and he said, he asked the Lord, I take this thorn away. I've asked the Lord this stuttering thing. Take this thing. You've got something in your life. Yes, Lord, I take it away. God says, to him, I'm not going to take it away, but you're going to experience my grace is enough. And you're going to experience that my power is made perfect in your weakness. He actually says, I'm going to use you and this stuff in your life because of the power of who I am, says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead in your life. And I'm going to take you, Paul, and all your stuff, your past, your sin, your stuff, your, yourself, all of that, and I'm going to do such a work in you, and you're going to be a new man in Christ. And I'm going to change the world through you. That's what God wants to do in every one of us. And what's glorious, you know, uh, Philippians 1, and I'm almost through, hang in. In Philippians 1, Paul said this. He's actually, uh, he writes Philippians, he's in prison. He thinks he's going to die. He's going to be martyred for the faith. And, and of course, he is eventually. It isn't this time. It's another time when he writes Second Timothy, but here he's in prison. All you know, he, he's, he, he's a chain between some, some guards in the pit of this place, which is not good. This is a bad circumstance in this life. But here's what he says. He's chained, but here's what he says. Philippians 1, 12, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, this bad thing, this, these chains, has really served to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, the whole world sees this as a bad thing. I realize now God has even used this as a victory. You know what? I saw stuttering as, as a chain in my life. I see my sin as a chain in my life. I see all the stuff, the junk in my life as a chain. You know what? Jesus Christ has broken those chains. He's the one who forgives sin. 
He's the one who puts the hole, who fills all the holes in my life. And he, and he actually takes us and accomplishes and does a supernatural thing in us. That's the point. That's what the church is supposed to be. Not just people who are just hoping and wishing. We know who he is. We know what we have. And we know, hey, I'm supposed to witness and I know I can't. And I got fear and trembling, but I know there's someone in me who's going to bear witness through me if I just step out by faith. Scared to death, yes. But just obey him and trust him to say what he wants to do. I want to know that power. And then third, and actually my time is gone. I've already used it. Although I did not use any timeouts along the way. <laughs> but just so you know, just, just uh, in conclusion, three is, is, I want to know that power. Hey, I'm signing up for this knowing Jesus stuff. I'm signing up for this powerful thing. I want that power. I want that in my life. But then he says, also, we may... Share, share his sufferings. The old King James says, I know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, I don't understand all, all, all that. And it's no fun to sign up for that. And to be honest, I'm not signing up for suffering. But Paul says, hey, there's something there about knowing Jesus. There is a fellowship, he says, of my sufferings, of those Jesus said. Because Jesus suffered for us, right? And you know, the apostle Paul suffered for us. In fact, in Acts 9, when Jesus was calling the apostle Paul, he tells the guy who discipled him, Ananias, he said, Ananias, I'm going to show this guy, Paul, how much he is going to suffer for my name's sake, he says. This guy, and he suffered. You want to know how much he suffered? Read 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 11. Uh, 23, 28, he has a list of all the stuff he went through. Paul says, you know what? I am proud to suffer for the one who suffered for me. And ultimately, third, uh, uh, second Timothy 3.12 says this, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Which simply seems to be saying, if a person looks like Jesus, they will be persecuted. If they're not being persecuted in any way, it may mean they don't much look like Jesus. Because he says it will happen. And sufferings for his sake, maybe that means, I don't understand, but maybe it just means being misunderstood the way Jesus was misunderstood. Maybe it means as Jesus, he was the object of, of the world's ridicule and persecution. Maybe that means that's what I'm supposed to do. Maybe just to bear the reproach of the world just the way Jesus did. But ultimately, Jesus paid the price of following the will of his Father to do whatever it meant, go wherever it meant, even if it means the cross. Jesus said, I'm going to do it. I want to be a part of that. I want to experience that. To know what that is, to be there. Because Philippians 1, 29, just a few chapters back, said, it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but that you should also suffer for his sake. And then the last thing uh, is the pursuit. It's the goal. It's the end. And the end is becoming like him in his death. The old King James says, being because I memorized it in the old King James, being conformed unto his death, being like him. Now, what does that mean? Being, well, I think it means this, being like him in his death, meaning the reason Jesus Christ came to this earth, the meaning, the reason for the incarnation of God in human flesh was the cross. That's the reason why he came. He had to die for our sin, to be the sacrifice for, for the world's sin. And, and obviously also to be buried and rise again to give eternal life. That's the point. That, that's the reason why he came. Well, he fulfilled all that. He, he did all that. How did he do that? And this is the point. How did he do that? Well, two things. He surrendered to the will of his Father, and he obeyed the Father every step of the way. Wherever it led, Jesus said yes. That's true for the Apostle Paul. That's what he said. That's true of us. Hey, we just die. That's what Jesus said. Hey, if you want to follow me, he says, hey, you deny yourself. Take up your cross daily as dying to ourself. And follow me, he says. You just surrender your life. And you just 
follow me. Well, Paul says here, all, all this stuff he gained, all he did is in knowing Christ. The fact is, he met Jesus in Acts 9, changed his life. All these gains he thought he once had, now he realizes the ultimate goal and person of my life is the passing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Now he knows the knowledge of Christ. He's got that. He's experiencing the righteousness of Christ because he's not living on his own rights. That's verse 9. He's living the righteousness of Christ. And he has the fellowship with Christ, even if it means the fellowship of his suffering. And he's experiencing the glory of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glory. So Paul is able to say at the end of his life, 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8, listen to this, and I'm done. He said, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Now, he's speaking about his death. But we didn't even say death. He says departure. <laughs> but the image is, I am living in such a way my life is being poured out for him. And verse 7 says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all who've loved his appearing. Ultimately, he says in verse 11, that by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection of the dead. The end result of this whole, the, the upper call of God in Christ Jesus, which is Philippians 3.12, the goal of this whole thing, the purpose of the whole thing, obviously, ultimately, is heaven, glory, the resurrection. When I die, my last breath, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, last thing I do here, last thing I see here, hopefully it's my wife, Sheila, who loved me most. I'm going to die, open my eyes on this side, and I'm going to see the, the person who loves me the most, Jesus. That's the goal. That's the deal. But until that happens, the goal is to live life here in the fullness of a relationship with Jesus Christ, knowing and living in that power of His Holy Spirit in us and fulfilling His plan and purpose and will for our lives as we surrender and as we obey. That's the secret of His life. I pray I want to know Jesus more.